the speaker, <laughs> the speaker of the hour is going to be uh, Brother Joe Chesser. Uh, he is uh, from Paragool, uh, 1968, uh, CRC graduate. Met his wife here and has been married for 53 years. Uh, he has three children, uh, one of which uh, graduated here. Uh, 13 grandchildren in total. Uh, and one, one great grandchild. Uh, he was awarded the Distinguished Alumnus Award last year, 2020. Uh, he's been preaching full time uh, for 53 years now. Currently works uh, in Jackson, Missouri, at the Fruitland Church of Christ. Uh, he's been working there for 18 years. Um, if you would join me in prayer, our dear, great, and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for all the blessings that you give us. We thank you for your servant Joe. Uh, we pray that ready recollection of the things he's prepared and that we would listen attentively to uh, the lesson that he gives us. Uh, Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us. We thank you for this uh, couple days, Father, that we can open up your word and go into deeper detail into the lessons that you have us learn. Right. So, Father, we just pray that uh, everything that happens uh, from this day and the next few will be pleasing under your sight. I pray that we would always look to be the light into this world and strive to be. Uh, Father, it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. I hope this is on, is it? Good deal. say to start with this afternoon, but uh, I think the thing that I want to start with is how impressive it is that you guys are here at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> that is impressive. And I am thankful for Jeremy just warming you guys up. Uh, really good lesson. I appreciate that. And I appreciate how you introduced what I want to talk about. Uh, we'll see about idolatry here in just a minute. But uh, it's just a pleasure to be back at College Ridge College. I, I have so, so many fond memories of this place. Uh, the people, the campus, the life I found here. <laughs> you know, a lot of good things, a lot of good things. And I uh, can't think of but one or two negative things. And I'm not going to tell you what they are. But I try to think of that. But anyway, we're just, I'm just grateful to be here able to talk to you and grateful to uh, be able to talk about our text this afternoon, Isaiah chapter 46. Um, you know, it's Jeremy talked about idols and how they're still real today, right? They are. So what I, I, what I want to say about that is what he says in, in Isaiah 46 is relevant every one of us today, relevant as it can be. We don't have the kind of idols that they have, but we certainly have idols. That's what we're going to look at this afternoon. Don't you laugh when you read Isaiah talking about the idols, how they would take a chunk of wood and then boil their soup with part of it and part of it and make a God and say, deliver me? Isn't that funny? If it wasn't so serious, it would be hilarious. How somebody, could you talk about flat earth ideas? You know, you have this own chunk of wood here, and you say, okay, you deliver me. Now, I'm going to shake the way I want you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook the food on you that I want to cook, but you are going to deliver me. I can understand flat earth better than that. <laughs> and yeah, it was real. Very real. And the principle there is just as real today. Just as real. In Isaiah chapter 46, he starts talking about, specifically, the foolishness of idolatry. And for the first time in the book, 
he mentions specific idols. Up until this point, he's talked about idolatry in general. Uh, but when he gets to chapter 46, the Spirit inspires him to tell about future problems with idolatry. But the things he talks about in chapter 46 didn't happen yet. It didn't happen for a while. It was during the captivity, the Babylonian captivity. They're not there yet. But, it, but that just underscores, you know, what uh, Spencer said last night, what was emphasized again this morning and this afternoon about the sovereignty of God. You know, God knows what's going to happen in the past, in the future, and we'll see more about that as we work through this chapter. Back in chapter uh, 44, just to to show some of the foolishness of this. And I got my paper took in the wrong way, so just a second. Chapter 44, verse 19. No one stops to think, no one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I use for fuel, I even baked bread over its coals, I roasted meat, and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? The foolishness of idolatry. But he has, that's just the, the foundation. Then he gets into chapter 46 and he goes into specifics about what he's talking about. How foolish, how foolish it is to trust in idols. He talks about how Babylon is going to be the power and he's going to talk about the gods of Babylon as they believe as their power. And yet it's, it's, it's not true. It's not real. I think it's hard for us sometimes to imagine living in Isaiah's time or previous times when they actually had idols that they would carve out of wood or stone or whatever, metal, and they would pick them up and they would carry them and put them in a prominent place in their house. And then they would worship it. And if they needed to move, they'd have to pick it up, move it to another place. And that's the concept going on here in chapter 46. Idols are a burden that has to be carried. Look at chapter 46, uh, the, the first verse or two. Bell bows down to Nebo. Bell bows down. Nebo stoops low. Their idols are borne by beasts of burden. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. They stoop down. They stoop and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. You know the really frightening thing about idolatry? That is just as real today as it was then, is that the fact that we get in our heads and we can serve God and other things at the same time. You know, as I was preparing for this lesson, my wife uh, in her Bible class was, was preparing for her kid, uh, little bitty kids. And she came across 2 Kings chapter 17. I give her credit for, for this, uh, not for writing it, but for reminding me of what it says there. Turn over real quick to 2 Kings 17. And it's so relevant to then and now. 2 Kings chapter 17. The last part of the chapter, verses 32 and 33. from which they had been brought. Drop down to verse 40. 
They would not listen, however, but persisted in their former practices, even while these people were worshiping the Lord. They were serving their idols. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do as their fathers did. If you look at the next chapter, it, it introduces us to King Hezekiah. This is in the time of Isaiah, when he was living. The practices that he's talking about in chapter 46, back in our text, are things that were commonly going on right then. They were practicing, oh, they, they, they did the things that God wanted them to do, but they weren't exclusive about it. They had their eyes, too. And so Isaiah, by the Spirit's direction, is helping them to see how foolish, how foolish that is. I think the chapter can be broken into four basic sections. The first section is God ridicules idolatry. I just read that from verse two, verses 1 and 2. Because idols are a burden. And all the, as I said, all the references to the pagan deities and idols to this point were, were just general. But here he specifically mentions Bel, also known as Marduk, and Nebo or Nabu, depending on you know their names. Those are the two primary gods of the Babylonians. Now you're probably more familiar with those names than you might remember. Uh, you remember Belteshazzar, the name that they changed Daniel from Bel his name, which, by the way, Daniel means God is my judge. Well, in order to get their minds twisted away from their allegiance to their God, they gave them names that were about these false gods. Belteshazzar comes from Bel, which means Bel protects his life. Well, Daniel never did really go by that. The other three, they kind of switched. I don't know if it's their choice or not, but in Scripture, they switched. And their names also contain uh, some of the uh, connections with their, their false gods. Or uh, Nebuchadnezzar himself. The word Nebuchadnezzar means, may Nebo protect the crown. So their names had allegiances to their false gods. And they did that so that they would forget Jehovah God. They didn't want Daniel to remember that God is his protector. They wanted him to think about uh, Bel. Well, interestingly, each year, the Babylonian New Year, which is about this time of year in our calendar, the statue of Nebo was uh, carried from the nearby city of of or Sippa to Babylon for a festival. <clears throat> At this festival, when they, they carried, they put this uh, idol on a cart, and the animals carried it over from Or Sippa to uh, Babylon, and they had this huge festival where they honored their God. You wonder why they didn't ever wonder, why is it that he doesn't take himself over there? Why can't he just walk over there or jump over there or just appear over there? Why do humans have to pick him up, load him up, wear the animals out, and that cart going across over here? Why, why is that? Well, evidently, they never thought of that, or if they did, they didn't think much about it. But Isaiah certainly did. That's what we see in these first two verses of the chapter. You know, they have to be cared. The poor beast staggered under the weight. And the people cannot protect the gods. They go off in the captivity. You know, back in that time, too, every city had their gods. And one of the things that went on was when one city captured another city, they also captured that city's god and just added it to their collection of gods. And so what they're thinking was, well, if my god captures this God, then my God must be greater than this God. And so they had these wars, and whoever was in control, their gods were the best gods. But they were also worshiping these other gods. And that was part of the, the difficulty, I think, 
when Israel was carried off, or Judah was carried off into Babylonian captivity, their God allowed that to happen. What does that say about their God to the Babylonians and then the other nations? What does that say? In the pagan thinking, they're saying these gods are greater than the one true God. Well, Isaiah is telling us, uh uh, that's not true. That's not the way it is. Because those gods are burdened to bear. They weary the animals under the impotence of these gods. And so when trouble comes, the people scatter, flee, because their gods can't do a thing to protect them. When their enemy takes them over. Back in chapter uh, 45, Isaiah mentions the future ruler, Cyrus. And uh, the one true God was about to bring in Cyrus because the one true God is the sovereign God. And he's controlling all of this. And he's the one who allowed Israel, or Judah, to go into captivity. He's the one that freed them. He's the one that set up Nebuchadnezzar. And he's the one that set up Cyrus and and all the others down in succession of those, of those nations. And the Babylonian gods could do nothing about Cyrus. He was, they just lost. They couldn't even save themselves. So how foolish is it for us to put our faith and trust in material things of the world? Reminded of the parable Jesus taught about the rich fool whose barns just cross, you know, brought forth abundantly, and then he built bigger barns to contain all this stuff. And God said, the sovereign God said, You're gonna to die tonight. What's gonna to happen to all this stuff? Who's in control? Who's in charge? Certainly not your full barns, but they let you die. But that's kind of what we do. We let the things that we treasure. And we have our own kind of gods, as Jeremy pointed out. We, it's still alive today, even in the Bible Belt. Idolatry is still alive. We still worship things. Well, we worship our God, but in addition to them, we have these other gods that we maybe think of lesser, but maybe not always. Maybe it's our pickup truck. Jesus made it clear, no one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so Isaiah 46 is a wake-up call for us. Don't look at the things of the world to be your gods. The things in which you trust and depend. There's only one God. The second part, part of this chapter is the next two verses, verses 3 and 4. The first part is God ridicules idolatry. The second part, God makes it clear that I am the one who carries you. You carry your God, but I carry you. Look at verses 3 and 4. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all who remain in the house of Israel, you whom I have, and notice this, you whom I, God is saying, I have upheld since you were conceived. And I have carried since your birth. Even in your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you. And I will carry you. I will sustain you. And I will rescue you. The uh, relationship committee nailed it. Who's carrying who? You have to carry your gods, but I carry you. Who's carrying who? 
So how different the Lord's relationship with his people is than the, the other peoples with their idols. I don't know of any contrast that could be greater than that. The Lord does not need to be saved or carried or born or moved. It's just the opposite. He cares. He sustains. He takes care of his people. Instead of being a burden to be born, he upholds the house of Jacob. In fact, God has always been doing that very thing. It says, I have upheld you since you were conceived, since you were born. I have carried you since your birth, even to your old age, and your gray hairs. I'm the one who takes care of you. The God of their history is also the God of their future. No matter what the future may hold for them, the God of our past will be the God of our hope to rescue us in the future, the coming days. I like the way God's Word translation puts it. I'll take care of you. Even when your hair is turned gray, I'll support you. I made you, and I will continue to take care of you. I'll support you and save you. Very simply put, I will carry you. seen it all the way through the Old Testament history. God's always the one who carried his people. And he still is. But in this chapter is some interesting contrast. Idols are lifeless, non-living. The Lord is the great I am, the ever-present. Idols must be made by people. The Lord made the people. Idols have to be carried in our burden. The Lord lifts our burdens and carries our loads. Idols must be protected and rescued. The Lord protects and rescues us. People grow old, but the Lord is ageless, never grows old, always the great I am. And what was true in Isaiah's time is still true. And because of that, because of that, we today can have the great hope that God wants his people to have, no matter what the century might be. Jesus said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus said, come unto me all who are weary, heavy laden, and burdened, and I will give you rest. As Isaiah later prophesied in chapter 53, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our so instead of trusting the things that we possess or, or the powers and abilities that we might have or the people around us that gives us support, Isaiah is saying, trust in God and only in God because he makes all these things possible, all these blessings and enjoyments that we have. So number one, God ridicules idolatry. Number two, it's God who carries you. Number three, is the challenge that God gives to Judah through Isaiah. The challenge is the house of Jacob to compare, compare him with them. Just look at it. Think about it. Verse 5, chapter 46. To whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? So God repeats the challenge he made back in chapter 40, verse 25. To whom will you compare me or who is equal, says the Holy One? You know, just, just open your eyes and think about it. Surely you can see. When you stop and open your heart and your eyes, you can see. I'm not afraid of being compared 
What can compare to me? So mockingly, God, through Isaiah, prodded them to think about the gods they had commissioned by a goldsmith or a craftsman of some kind to make the God that they worshipped. They have to be, as I said earlier, once you commission a, a craftsman to make a God, then, then you take it home. You carry it home. It doesn't carry you. Compare. Who carries whom? Just today, I thought of this. You remember the story in, in, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 5 when, when the, the enemies had captured the Ark of the Covenant, they put it into the temple of Dagon, their God. The next morning, the idol fell over. Ah, okay. Well, that just happened. They pick it up, put it back. The next day, it fell over again. His head was broken off. His hands were broken off. He still worship that thing? Where's the power? They recognized that there was a power in the Ark of the Covenant that was not a day god, but it didn't translate to their devotion. They just want to get that, that Ark out of God. Get him out of here. Send it back. We don't want that thing here. But it did make it. Change their belief in their God. So what good are they? People give you to them, sacrifice for them, devote themselves to them, but for nothing, to no avail. On the other hand, the opposite is true, isn't it? Look at verses 8 through 11. Remember this, fix it in your mind, take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those things of long ago. I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come? I said, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. Wow. So God challenges them to think about things that are real. What have I done in the past? What, doesn't that show you what I can do in the future? Just think about these things. Fix it in your minds. And God lists some things that are just things that they could recall. They weren't unaware of these things. I am God, there is no other. They knew that from some Mount Sinai. God is to have no other God. I am the God, Lord God. You should have no other gods before me. But they did. And they still do. What God did, what God did want people to know about himself is, and it, it's, it's, it's amazing to me, I know the future at the beginning. People wish they knew that. There was no reason to bet on things because you didn't know the outcome of something. I mean, if you knew who's going to win a ball game before the first pitch, you could bet everything you have and you'd win because you know the end from the beginning. But we don't. That's why it's gambling. That's why people gamble with their souls. They gamble that. God doesn't really exist. God doesn't really know. God doesn't really mean what he says. But God knows the future because he plans the future and has the power and the love and the will to accomplish what he plans. He has the wisdom and the holiness to do it right. The Jews have known these things in the past. They've heard these stories. They may have even experienced some of them themselves. Just remember, God tells you, just remember, think about it. And of course, that's what this chapter challenges us to do. 
Oh, is it that we love and trust so much that in this world that even begins to compare with the sovereign Lord? You know, money says in God we trust, but is that really true? Do we? What if our company goes bankrupt? The stock market falls. challenged by elections, aren't we? That who is in control? Who's carrying whom? Sometimes we think, well, if we just get the right person in office, everything will be fine. It doesn't matter because God is sovereign. He places the people. I have a hard time sometimes believing that God put presidents in that he did. But he did. several years ago God is still the one in charge. So although we claim to put the kingdom of God first, why are we so committed to other things that robs us of our relationship with God? That challenges us to stay home or to go to a ball game instead of doing the things of the Lord. Or to just take our, our vacations and just forget about God until we come home. Or to worship our family more than we do the kingdom of God. Why is there so much division and selfishness in seeking our own way if we're seeking the kingdom first? If the Holy One is the most important to us, why do we have continuing problems with pornography, adultery, greed, materialism, anger, filthy language. You know. Why do we have problems with that? If it is God we trust, why do we allow vacant night and worry? Why do we just get stressed if it's in God we trust? Isaiah 46 should challenge us to look within ourselves. And the chapter then concludes, verses 12 and 13. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted who are far from righteousness. I am bringing my righteousness near. It's not far away. And my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion my splendor to Israel. We heard about that in this last hour. The promise of the future God has promised is our promise. So don't let the things that we love so much in this world deter us from, from focusing on the promises and the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. And, and Spencer made that clear last night. Isaiah makes it clear here. Who's sovereign? These silly idols. They can't take care of themselves. They can't change one thing. They can't even protect themselves. But God, yes, God is sovereign. Only he has the power to save. You know what? It doesn't matter if our hearts are stubborn or not. God is still sovereign. But it matters to us. It's not going to change God if we lose our souls. Because God is God. But it will change us. God is going to do what God wants to do. That's what sovereignty is. And this whole passage is calling on Israel to believe and to trust in the sovereignty of God. Solve the sovereignty problem. So we as the people of God today, we live in a, our world is just dominated by paganism, just like it was in Israel's time. Different stuff, same principles. You know, last Monday, the Galpol released some information that sets a shocker for the very first time since they were keeping track since 1937. 
church membership in the United States fell below the majority in America. 47% of U.S. adults belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque. 47%. Are we living in a painted time? Absolutely. Is God still God? It's tempting to abandon our confidence and our courage and try just to get along the best we can. But don't lose heart. Isaiah 46 is here to tell us, don't lose heart. Regardless of how dominant our enemies might become, regardless of how hopeless the future seems to us at the present, we need to remember that God will rescue and deliver us from our enemies. Faith assures us that it doesn't matter what happens. Even if it's not in our lifetime, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen sooner or later because that's what the promise of God is. So the essential point is to hold fast to the conviction that you have learned and received from, from Isaiah's words. God is sovereign. God knows the end from the beginning. God will rescue and deliver. And although we are in the world, our gods must not be of the world. Always remember to take heart the words of Jesus. In the world, you'll have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Never forget who's carrying the food. Let's pray. Our God, what a tremendous message you give us in this chapter from Isaiah. What an awesome awesome thing you are, our God, who knows the end at the beginning. Our great creator who loves us more than anything and gives us such great promises that all we have to do is trust you, follow your word, your will. All we have to do is keep our faith in you, in our eyes on Jesus. And we pray, God, Jesus, we pray.